views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Moms, are you ready to become enlightened, empowered, and stress-free? Well, get ready because you are about to tune into vibrant, powerful moms helping everyday women create an extraordinary life with Debbie Pokornik. Each week, Debbie discusses topics to help you become self-aware, inspired, and on track to create the life you crave. It's time to stop settling and start thriving. And it all begins now on Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to the Vibrant Powerful Mom Show. I'm your host, Debbie Pokornik, and today I want to talk some more about stress. Now, on a previous show, I talked about why we need stress in our life, what causes it, and how to become aware of it in your body. I introduced the analogy of an elastic, which in case you don't remember, because this was about a year ago that I did this, it involves tuning into how stressed you feel and then determining your sweet spot, which is that place where you function best. So this elastic can help you to become aware of how much stress you can handle, when you might need to bring something new into your life or else risk unconsciously creating drama in your life. Yes, we actually will do that. As well as what amount of stress will put you at risk for health concerns. Basically, you use a number system of zero to 10. So with zero being absolutely no stress. So if you picture an elastic, an elastic at zero would just sit on your hand. It's not doing anything. It's not serving a purpose. For humans, you could probably be at a zero when you're in that really zen sort of state that comes from deep meditation. But for the most part, while living our life, most of us are going to function best at around a three or a four. We need some stress to keep us going. Now, a 10 with the elastic would mean that the elastic actually breaks. In human terms, this would mean breaking down. It would be very serious. It would leave you in the hospital or worse. So you can go back and listen to that show if you need more. It was called Ideas for Decreasing Stress and Increasing Calm. And I think it was in May of 2017. Um, Or you can even pick up my ABCs of Stress Busting for free off of my website at empoweringenergy.com. But for now, just know that when I refer to your elastic, how tight it is or loosening your elastic, that's what I'm talking about. All right. So step number one to living with stress is self-awareness. It's becoming aware of how it presents in your body, what amount is optimal for you to be at your best place, and what sort of indicates that you need to release some of it and perhaps even very quickly. All right. So that's what I talked about in that other podcast. Step two is about the tools, the strategies and practices that you have in your toolbox to help you deal with stress, preferably before it becomes a problem. So when I ask people, what do you do when you notice that you're really stressed out? What are your favorite tools to use to get rid of your stress? They typically come up with maybe five to 10 things that they do. And although there are a few anomalies, usually their list can be divided into very predictable categories. So I have seven that they usually fall into. The first one is exercise. So it might be running, it might be aerobics, it might be weightlifting, anything that falls in that weight or that exercise category. The second one is distraction. That might be music, it could be coloring, painting, even watching TV. For some, it will be uh, really thrilling things like driving really fast, skydiving, things that take your absolute total focus so you can't think about the stress in your life. That would fall in the category of distraction. Number three is comfort food or drinks. Some people will turn to tea or chocolate or ice cream or alcohol or smoking as a way to de-stress. The fourth category is connecting with others. So this might be talking with friends. Some will have a counselor, a therapist, a coach, uh, someone that they turn to, or even playing with their kids. 
The fifth category is usually sports. So the kinds of things uh, like teamwork, so football, hockey, racquetball, these kinds of, of games. The sixth one is tuning in to themselves. So doing things like yoga, meditation, maybe journaling or walking in a labyrinth or even following a labyrinth with your finger, that kind of thing that has you go inwards. And then the seventh category is connecting with nature. So maybe they like walking, they like petting an animal, riding a horse, sitting by a river or a flowing brook, that kind of thing. Now, a few of these tools are unhealthy, especially if you're stressed a lot, but most of them are really great tools. They can help you to keep your stress levels, you know, in that sweet spot and to um, put these tools into action anytime that you start to slip out of your sweet spot. In other words, you might go for a run when you get home because you can feel that you need to burn off some stress in order to really be a great parent to your children or to get along better with your spouse, okay? So you tune into them and you use them to help keep you calm. But what you might notice is that very few of them can be used in a situation like, for example, maybe you're at work, maybe you're in a meeting or you're grocery shopping, you're in a place where you're experiencing a difficult situation with other people. You can't really go for a run at that moment most of the time, or you can't sit by a babbling brook unless you're lucky enough to have one right outside your office building. So that means that while these stress relieving ideas are wonderful for those situations where you can have the time and freedom to put them into place, if that's all you have in your toolbox, you can run into trouble during really busy and stressful times in your life, which is when you most need to be able to de-stress. Okay, so just to make this really clear, I'm talking about when you're in a meeting and you feel maybe put on the spot and you've been burning the midnight oil to prepare for this meeting and now it feels like your boss is throwing you under the bus. So you need a tool right then because you can feel the stress building up in you. Or maybe your, your spouse, your parent, your child is suddenly hospitalized and you know they're in a real critical situation and so you can't leave the hospital, but you really are feeling the stress. Maybe you get that call from your mother-in-law, you know, you're at work, you're really busy at work, you've hardly got any time at all and she tells you, oh, I'm coming to your place, I'll be there tonight and I'm staying for a week. <laughs> or... Perhaps it's your hubby calling you and telling you that he's going to bring this important client home for supper and you know the house is a mess. There's no way you can get there early. You've got all this stuff on your plate. You were only going to have pizza because you're super busy and you've got the kids' parent council meeting, which you happen to chair. So can you see how in our life we have a lot of these kinds of situations come up and the tighter our elastic is when these new stress things develop, the harder it's going to be to calm yourself down in the moment. So you can imagine that on that really busy day at work, you're already probably going to be above the sweet spot on your elastic. So you need to have a whole variety of tools to use in any situation at a moment's notice, wherever you might be. And this is where most of us are lacking because often we don't even realize how stressed we are until we're caught in that traffic jam and someone goes flying by us in the lane that closes up ahead for construction and then cuts us off, you know, <laughs> and this construction's been going on for over a month and you think, what a jerk. And all of a sudden you snap, you're, you're ready with road rage because you're just so stressed. So, we really want to become aware of these things. And one of the ones for me that has always bothered me is if I'm really super stressed and somebody says something to me that feels wrong or that hurts me, I immediately get all emotional and I can feel that I'm going to cry. I'm going to spill all over right there. And that's not a good spot to be. That's not even who I am as a person. I'm a pretty strong person when push comes to shove. I actually remember when I was going to university and I was really working in that first year, the first 
degree. So I got my arts degree first. And I really, really wanted to have top marks in all my programs. I wanted to prove that I could be a good student because I had to get in uh, on that trust condition that I would do well. And so it was time for exams. And I had this very demanding schedule. I had five courses that I was taking and I all of them had exams and some of them had papers. And I was in a biology class that was known to be super hard. So it was taught by video. We had four different professors and we had this very challenging lab component. And so I had worked my butt off in order to be sitting at a B at that point when I was going in for my final exam. And so my exam was the next day and we had been given back our papers, our other tests, so that we could look at them, use them for studying. And I came across a question that I had gotten wrong. And no matter how I looked at it, no matter what I looked up in my books, I couldn't figure out why I had gotten it wrong. Now, one of the professors who happened to head up that faculty, his office was right across from where we would go and... um check out the marks on our tests or whatever. And oftentimes he would come out and chat with me when I was there because I just hung around a lot, I guess. And so him and I, I felt had kind of a, a nice rapport. But remember, videos are what taught the class. So he didn't know. He knew I was a student, but he didn't know me. He didn't know my name or anything. And uh, I decided, even though I lived in the country, I decided to phone him and ask him to explain this question for me because it felt really important. So I called, I got his machine, and I decided to leave a message saying to please call me. So that turned out to be a really big mistake. Now, I didn't know at the time, the reason he didn't answer his phone is he was at a budget cut meeting and as a head of the faculty, I can't remember if they were about to strike or if he was going to have to lay off some staff, but either way, he was feeling a lot of stress. Now, I, of course, was super stressed because my exam was the next day. I had been doing other exams. It was just a stressful time for me. And so when my phone rang and I answered it, I opened the conversation with him by saying, I found a question on my previous test and I don't know why it's wrong. Now, when he gave us our test back originally, they would tell us that if you find something wrong and it turns out you were marked wrong when it should have been right, we will fix your grade. And I think that's where he went. So he thought that I was going for extra points. I just wanted to understand why it was wrong because it could be on the exam and I needed to know it. So he got so upset with me. You're not, you know, it's too late now. You're not going to get anything for this. And he was very harsh, very snappy. He even expressed anger at having to call me long distance. I don't appreciate having to call you long distance, (laughs) which made sense now that I know he was in a budget meeting. (laughs) But before I knew it, I was in tears. I was bawling as I held on to the phone. And I'm trying to talk through it, right? Like, I just don't understand it, you know? And, oh man, it was such a terrible moment for me. And it probably was for him as well, but not for the reasons you would think. I think that he was probably thinking, oh, I have to be happening. I, you know, I've got so much on my plate and now I'm talking to a student and she's crying and I oh, just wish I'd never made the call, right? Now, I just want to point out one thing here. I was not at a breaking point. This is not a 10 on my elastic. I was probably around a 7 or an 8. When you hit a 10, I'm talking about a real breaking point. I mean that if you decided after that call that you just couldn't go on anymore, you're so upset about it that you decide to take your own life or you have a nervous breakdown, you end up in a puddle, my parents find me and have to you know, rush me to the hospital... It will affect your life forever. So you don't want to get to a 10. A 10 is very, very serious. Now, I didn't know anything about stress back then. I didn't understand it. I wasn't teaching it. But I did know that I was pretty upset about this. And after a while, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to sit down and study unless I did something about it. So one of the tools that I like to use is to write a letter. And I I do this, I sit down and I first vent everything I'm feeling, what's going on for me. I called the professor a jerk and, you know, said all these mean things to him. So I wrote it to vent. 
Then I went through and I took out a whole bunch of the emotion and any attacks that I made on him. And I started replacing it with facts. Then I went through it again for clarity and ease of reading. And then I probably went through it again just to to feel it. And this tool, what it's doing is it's helping me to process, process what I'm feeling, to look at things objectively, and even to put myself in my professor's shoes. So I'm starting to see his perspective. It was very healing. And I ended up getting an A on the exam. So the point is, you want to have a variety of tools you can use as stress crops up in your life. Now, I know in that situation, I probably could have gone for a run or go sat in a tree or done many other things. I didn't realize I was dealing with stress. I didn't have a plan. I did notice I can still remember sitting there. And you know how when you cry, you do that. (laughs) Well... When I did that, I noticed that that deep breath in kind of calmed me down. So I did start to breathe and calm myself. And as I did that, that's when I decided I needed to write the letter. Now, incidentally, this is very neat, I think. After I wrote the letter, I went back to that question on the exam. And something the professor had said in his anger, he had just like threw it out there. It was about the Krebs cycle, blah, blah, blah. I suddenly looked at the question again and I went, I get it. I understand. And you know what? Not that exact question, but another question very much like it was on the final exam. And if I hadn't figured it out, I would have lost a mark for that question. So a lot of the material in my Vibrant Powerful Mom show focuses on uh, ideas to help you deal with stress because now I know so much more about it. But back then, I really didn't know that. So you can check those out. There's a show about um, called Stress Hormone. And I share breathing techniques in there, way to get your oxytocin flowing, how to control your thoughts so you're not uh, going into fight and flight where you're not going to be able to function as well. And so when you start to learn these things, if you don't know them already, uh, you know, learn how to separate your ego from your higher self, all those kinds of things, it will help you to put this into practice in your life so that you're feeling less stressed overall and you can have these tools available for you. So if you feel like you're lacking tools, like I said before, pick up the ABCs to stress busting off of my site or even the five secrets to being vibrant. Both of them are there, both of them are free, and they're both giving tools on on uh, working with stress. So learning techniques that help you de-stress in the moment is an ongoing process in life. It's not like you can just take a course and be done. Interestingly, what works for one might not work for someone else. And even what works for you today might not work for you tomorrow. And to complicate things even further, what doesn't work for you today might work for you next week. So you want to have lots of tools and you want to try to refrain from writing one off just because it didn't work for you on that day. So make it a priority to accumulate tools and strategies that work for you and the situations you find yourself in. Step number three is to practice your tools in times of calm because times of action or crisis will often default you to autopilot. By the time you're an adult, you have developed a lot of coping skills which will automatically jump to the surface when push comes to shove. So even when they aren't great skills, like if they don't serve you well or they get you into trouble, you still will probably use them. So to combat that, you need to practice new tools until you get through that awkward phase, which is followed by the phony stage (laughs) and into a more comfortable one. And you need to do this when you aren't super stressed. So notice your breathing when you're driving on an icy road and you start to feel some tension and try taking some deep breaths or getting your oxytocin flowing with that special breath. Pay attention when your colleague's incessant whining is causing your shoulders to tense up. You notice your shoulders are up around your ears. And maybe try using shifting into curiosity to understand him better. Or practice your assertiveness to set some boundaries with him and see how that feels. Tune in when you feel annoyed at the bug flying around your head during the two minutes that you have to sit outside on your lunch. And maybe play with with hearing the bug and allowing it to be, just allowing it to be part of the background. Now, if you think the bug is going to bite you, I doubt that's going to work. So maybe choose a different strategy then. 
the point is, the more you practice in times of calm, the greater the chance you will actually use these things in times of crisis. Step number four, focus on what you can control and let go of what you can't, which is really a fancy way of saying, accept what you can't change. Accept it. Which brings me to what I think is the most important thing for you to know about stress. It's not how much stress you have in your life that determines its negative impact. It's how you perceive the stress that matters. Let me say that again, just a little differently. It's not the stress itself that is the problem. It's your thoughts about the stress, your opinion on how bad it is that makes it a problem. So notice how you are perceiving things and try shifting them around to see if you can take the intense stress out of what is going on. I have an experience from my own life that I often like to use where my husband and I, um, my husband was looking at losing his job at the time we had a three-year-old and a four-month-old baby and the corporation announced they were going to close their door. And I was on mat leave, but I had said I didn't want to come back early from mat leave. So I was going to be unemployed as well. And it was a very scary place to be. Well, we also happened to live in Manitoba. It was 1997. We had what we called the flood of the century. And uh, so our house ended up in the river. Normally it was beautiful right beside our house, but now our house was in the river. So the kids and I had gone to live with my parents. My husband had to follow us a short while later when the water was only six inches from the top of our dike and the forecast was for big winds. And in the end, our house was flooded and essentially destroyed. So now here we are, we've got two little kids, we're uncertain about income, we have no house. Any one of these things can cause stress. It was a new experience for us. There was so much uncertainty. We were already in debt. I was living with my mother, who I love very much, but who also challenges me to grow often. We were definitely being pushed out of our comfort zone. So the desire to focus on all the things that were going wrong was huge, but we made a conscious decision not to do that. And instead, we focused on what was going well, like the fact that we were all safe and sound, that we had family that would allow us to stay with them, Um, that my husband had managed to find another job. It was going to be a cut in pay and the company had no proven track record, but it showed how employable he really was. Now, don't get me wrong. There were definitely challenging moments throughout that where my elastic was up around seven or eight. But for the most part, we really focused on just supporting each other as much as we could, which means that there were times where I had to, I would support him and he would, uh, you know, have a little moment where he had a little meltdown. And then I would turn to my mom or my dad or my sister or my friend, and they would support me. That's what our support systems are all about. So, you know, we needed to use them and we did. I needed to trust that everything would work out and I just needed to really remember that feeling like a victim, thinking I was being picked on or throwing a pity party was not going to help. So how you perceive a situation is going to greatly influence how you deal with it and how stressed out you feel by it. So take advantage of the good times, play with your tools and strategies and and build a strong support system so that when challenges arise, you're able to use them effectively. Now, just for the record, our house was written off, which allowed us to buy a different house. We still needed to have a mortgage. Of course, it wasn't a gift, but it definitely helped. The corporation my husband was working for decided not to close its doors at the very last moment. So my husband's job was now not only secure, but he ended up with a nice promotion and It also was even a good thing that I had decided not to go back to my job because it was now way too far away after we moved to warrant staying on. So I don't want you to think that everything worked out just because we refused to get stressed out over it. Although I I have to say that in my life, that has actually been the experience. I do know that our refusal to see everything as bad or as punishment or unfair helped us to be healthier, to be better parents, and it helped us create a solid relationship, which as you can imagine, coming through that together could have torn us apart. So it's not the amount of stress you have in your life that makes a difference. It's how you perceive that stress that is most important. 
Step number five is to make self-care a priority so that you have lots of positive energy to fall back on if and when the going gets tough. If you don't know how to do this, go back and listen to my shows on creating healthy habits, fun ways to recharge your energy, getting emotions in motion, and so on. Finding time for you is critical when it comes to creating a healthy stress response. So a quick summary of those steps Number one, become aware of how stress presents in your body and decide what number your elastic sits at most days. Number two, take stock of and learn new tools, strategies, and practices so that you have some to use in any situation, anytime, anywhere to reduce your stress. Number three, practice new tools and techniques in times of calm so that you will actually use them when you are feeling stressed. Number four, control what you can, which is mostly how you perceive things. Notice how you're labeling things as good or bad. Focus on what's going right instead of what's going wrong. And number five, take care of yourself when the going is good so that you have lots of positive energy to fall back on when the going gets tough. Life is full of ups and downs. It's these moments which help us grow beyond our comfort zone and actually bring us to life. They don't always feel great when they're happening, but they feel a heck of a lot better when we make the effort to take back what control we can and refuse to allow it to stress us out. With much respect for you and the journey you are on, this is Debbie Pokornik wishing you a vibrant and powerful day. You've been listening to Vibrant Powerful Moms with host Debbie Pokornik. If you've enjoyed this show, please give us a shout out and leave us a positive review. To find out more about Debbie and her sisterhood of vibrant, powerful moms, visit empoweringenergy.com. That's empowering with letters N-R-G.com.